know your brand, figure out who you are as a writer, and figure out your、okay. brand. You can't go out and just be like, "I'm an author. I write a book. Cool. That's all I do." Know your brand. Know your message. Okay. And figure out your niche. That's the other thing, and understand、okay. that your publisher is probably not going to do it. They're not going to market you. It, it's just, it's、yeah. not like days where it used to be, where you used to get a big fat like, "Here's your check," you know, and then you just go write the books. We'll handle the rest. That's not it. Hi, friends. This is Read and Write with Natasha podcast. My name is Natasha Tynes, and I'm an author and a journalist. In this channel, I talk about the writing life, review books, and interview authors. Hope you enjoy the journey. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of、uh, Read and Write with Natasha. So today, I have with me fantasy author Danielle Orsino. So. The creative work of storytelling has been with Danielle、uh, ever since she was a child. So Danielle M. Orsino,、uh, she you know loved martial arts and she has her she had her nursing career. And then one day, like any others, you know, what happened is she was treating one of her patients, and then she realized that she wanted some distraction,、uh, and that's how she delved into the world of fantasy. So Danielle took it upon herself to tell her patients a story, a fantastical narrative that would leave the confines of the IV room walls and land upon a page. Before she knew it. Uh, what started as an imaginative tale to pass the time turned into a book, followed by an entire series. Here we go: the birth of faith. So, wow, Danielle, thank you for joining me. What a tale!、Huh? So, you were a nurse, and then you decided to go into the, fan-、uh, the you know, the fantasy world. So, welcome, welcome. And if you can tell me about your transition, if you can start how you went from being a nurse to being an, an author of fantasy books. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. First and foremost,、uh, it was a bit of an unorthodox journey. I didn't set out and think, "Oh, one day I'm going to be an author." I was a martial artist, competitive, transferred into nursing, and then I just met a patient who just needed a distraction. And as we were having a conversation, he mentioned little factoids about himself that, after a year of treating、okay. him, I just didn't know about, and that just turned into a conversation. As we were talking. He just said、uh, we made a conversation a comment about Lyme disease, which is what he was being treated for. And、mm. I said, "Oh, well, you know where Lyme comes from." And he kind of we went down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and all this stuff. And、oh. for some reason, out of my mouth came, "No, the Fay." I don't know to this day why I said it. I wasn't reading any books about Fay, nothing like that.、I、was actually on a vampire kick. And、uh, he looked at me and he went, "Well, who are the Fay?" And I just started telling the story off the top of my head. Just making、okay. it up, and he just settled back in his chair, and we just started kind of telling this story. And from there, it took on a life of its own. But I still didn't think I would be an author. I was going、okay. to go to physician assistant school. I had like my life planned out. I was going to go pump some faces full of Restylane. You know, it was all it was all set. And he kept encouraging me, "Go home, write this down." Because every day he came in, I told him another chapter, and we just、uh... flowed. And he was the one who was like, "Go home and write this down." I'm telling you. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then eventually, I took his advice and wrote it down, and the story kind of came from there. So it was just、oh, wow. the universe. And who are the Fey? The Fey in this in this version of you know the Fey are、uh, fallen angels, or you know the Fellowship Ages of Earth, the Defenders of Earth.、Uh, in this story, they are angels who did not one side did not get involved in the war with Lucifer. They were sent by the Creator to prep. The Earth for the Creator's great next, next experiment, which is humans, and then the、okay. other side are the Power Brigade angels, who are the foot soldiers of the Archangels.、So、they were actually fighting, and then both sides are promised, you know, you're going to go home. Of course, you know, as soon as your job is done, of course, you're coming back to the Shining Kingdom. And then one day they hear, they both hear the gates lock,、oh. and they can't go home, and they're、okay. just like, "Whoa, wait, what just happened?" And they can't get an answer. So each side blames the other one. Okay. And they develop into the court of light and dark, and they then take the acronym of Fey. Some say the fallen angels of Earth. Some say the Fellowship Ages of Earth. The court of light calls it that as the defenders of Earth, since they were there protecting it from day one. And、okay. then, as they sit here, they kind of watch humanity develop, and some take on more of a nurturing aspect, 
Okay. And others say, no, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, things develop, but the only thing they both agree on is that as they are worshipped by the humans as the uh, primal kind of pagan gods and goddesses, they find that they get power from that worship. Their elemental gifts and, uh, you know, defending gifts kind of expand. So now they realize human worship equals power and they don't feel there's enough for both sides. So a war breaks out and we kind of watch what happens. Oh, and I love the outfit, by the way. And are you dressed you. as who? Are you dressed as I'm, a fae? Or I'm like, giving what, a little Queen Aurora. If you can tell us a bit out, uh, you know, about your outfit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like to, I'm a cosplayer to begin with. So uh, the okay. idea of dressing as the fae whenever I can, bring a little sparkle into my life, you know. Okay. Hurts. So I always dress up as characters or as a fae whenever I do interviews or whenever I can because it makes me smile and, and where how, did you actually did you make it yourself or did you purchase like how where did you get uh, the, the dress from? I made the dress I actually made this oh, wow. um this the shoulder piece uh this piece is from Aconite Designs okay. and then the crown is actually Aurora's crown that Enchanting Earth made after she okay. read the book Jamie is a crystal shop owner she actually read the book oh wow. and decided Aurora needs a crown and made the crown, and now she sells it in the store as Aurora's crown. So, oh, that's who loves nice. Fae can have a piece of the fae, and it, it looks like the you know the cover as well. It's similar except for the horns, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I actually, yeah, I have that headpiece. That is Lady Serena, who is okay. uh, Queen Aurora's best friend. Ah, okay, this is amazing. What influenced you, like? How did you delve into this world, you know, growing up? What kind of books did you read uh, that made you uh, um, gravitate towards fantasy? I don't know that I necessarily went toward fantasy consciously. I didn't know that's where I was going, but okay. I'm, I'm a huge comic book geek. That's ah, just okay. where I, you know, I did, I do, you know, as a kid, I read like Secret of Nim and things like that which I, I enjoyed, but um, Chris Claremont, okay. like I said, you know, is one of my biggest influences. I, I just, I love comic books, George Perez. I was always into the comic book side and that probably influenced me more writing this than anything else. A lot of the characters okay. in the book, King Jarbok, things like that, they can be traced back to uh, specific characters, you know, from comic books like Magneto from X-Men, King Jarbok and Magneto are very, very similar in the sense that you may not agree with their methods, but they are doing what they feel is right for their kin. Okay. So you might not agree with them, but it, it's it's there. So a okay. lot of times, even in my style, I leave little, little Easter eggs. Okay. And that really comes from comic books more than anything else. Oh, interesting. So this is the first in a three-book series, correct? Uh, I've actually finished uh, seven, seven altogether now. Uh, Volume one oh, is complete. Wow. Okay. I finished it, plus one novella. So there's eight. Uh, it's Locked Out of Heaven, Thine Eyes of Mercy, From the Ashes, Kingdom Come, A Fae is Done, and Forgive Us. That's the six in volume one. Uh, then there's a novella, uh, Fire, Ice, Acid, and Heart, which is a dragon tournament, which you could read on the side or in between. But uh, volume one is complete now, and I'm actually already working on volume two. But uh, oh, wow. yeah, kind of just exploded. Uh, I, <laughs> I see that. I know where I was going with it. You know, I'd like to tell you I had this whole plan, but no, nah, there wasn't a plan. You know, if you want to learn how not to write a book, come talk to me. I can give you all the insight on that. Uh, oh, God. But no, uh, it just, it went, but I knew as I finished Forgive Us, I, this was the end. Like that was volume one. Volume one was done at that point. Because okay. I did jump genres at the end. I, I jumped more to urban fantasy and took it into modern world. So at the end of Forgive Us, there's um, four little short stories that take you through time to okay. wind up at the end in uh, modern day, in New York, okay. modern day, to lead you into the next set of characters. So I did okay. kind of give this little timeline jump. And that's when I knew, okay, volume one is done. We're going to move on to some new characters. We'll bring back some old favorites, but it's a whole new set. So what is your writing routine? Do you still work as a nurse? No, I don't. I, I'm a writer now. I don't work as a nurse anymore. I was as good with nurse and healthcare kind of burned you out. Okay. Uh, I did think I was going to go to PA school. I got in. 
And it was all this like, yes, I'm going. And then they hit you with how much it costs. And then you're like, oh, okay. I was not planning on $250,000 up front. So let me give this writing thing a shot. That's when all of a sudden I, I turned to my patient. And went, so you think this make a good book, huh? You know, it turned quick. But um, okay. my writing routine for the first couple books, I wrote all simultaneously by hand. Okay. I did not have a plan. I just sat down, started writing. And okay. then I'd pick up a journal, write, and then I'd be like, oh, people are going to want to know how this happened. And I pick up another journal and start writing. So that was how I started. And I still kind of stick to that in the sense that all the books are handwritten first. Okay. That's what I do everything. <clears throat> so then I take it to the computer. So you're a full time writer now. Yeah, I do. Um, I write and then I do social media work and stuff like that for my publisher as well. And Mark, ah, okay. you know, ah, so I okay. do, you know, I do that. And uh, then with another partner of mine, uh, C.R. Rice, who's another amazing young adult author, uh, I run the pop up bookshop with her, where we take it through the Galaxy Con circuit, introducing indie authors to an audience. Maybe okay. they don't get a chance. And we run that as well. Uh, four or five times a year, okay. you know, when we go through Galaxy Con. So I have other things that keep me within the publishing author realm, plus okay. the writing. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in how, you know, writers can sustain themselves, you know, and it's, you know, these days, you know, the, the Stephen Kings of the world who can live off their writing are very few, right? And so I'm really interested in the side gigs, the, all the stuff that, you know, make authors pursue their dream, right? Um, so that's good to know that you do other publishing related things. And I, I think that's that's a really nice uh, blend of both. Um, yeah, I have to keep it in the realm, I think. This way you stay relevant too. Oh uh, yeah, true, true. I like this. So how many hours do you write a day? Uh, depends on what I'm working on. When I was doing, I just turned in a novella probably <laughs> about a month and a half ago. Yeah, about that. Okay. And that one took me a lot longer than I thought it would. You know, I had all okay. these great ideas, but actually, and I know that I would spend, depending on when kind of mm -hmm. it hit me, three and a half, four hours trying to get things in and out. But um, if I'm really like for volume two, when I really get something, uh, I can spend hours just, just writing. It just kind of depends. But I also don't have a set time where I'm like, okay, I'm going to write from nine to five. I don't do that. There's always um, a journal by my bedside because for some reason, okay. 3 a.m. is when these characters mm. decide to come to life in my head and knock on it and go, excuse me, tell my story now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why, but that's when the best ideas come. So there's always a journal. I have journals all over my house. My husband okay. thinks I'm crazy because it just, it something pops in my head where I'm watching TV and I'm like, oh, that's that plot hole. And then it's like, I need something to write it down where I get that hint of something like literally I think I was mm -hmm. in the bath last night and I'm like I had an idea for a series yeah and I'm like that's what I want to do and then I'm yeah. looking around I'm like where is you know so it was one of those where it's like remember remember don't forget don't forget don't forget so I don't really I can't really say oh this is like this is I know people have processes and they're like this yeah process I now I'm not one of those it's just okay. when it hits the real housewives are on in the background RuPaul's drag race like I can't I can't write in silence I need the chaos. Okay. It just helps my brain work. Oh, wow. So how are the books doing in terms of the sales? If, if you don't mind sharing with us. Um, oh, no. Um, you know, it's hard to stand out. Uh, I was on the Tamron Hall show. Last oh, wow. March. Good for you. Yeah. March. Yes. And that was, that was very helpful. You know, obviously you see a bump and then every time the show replays, you see another bump. Uh, so, and doing the podcast, things like that, it definitely helps. Uh, I remember the first time I never knew you could check. Like I didn't know Kindle had a bestseller list for your niche. And the first time like, uh, I got the alert, you know, somebody was like, Oh, do you know your number like 50 on the Kindle bestseller for like dragons? I was just like, what? And like, oh, I didn't uh, know this existed. And, you know, you're screenshotting it everywhere. And you're like, did you okay. see this? Okay. You know, so I I've made the bestseller list a couple times now uh, for different, for my different, uh, you know, niches and stuff, which is awesome. And I've been really excited about that. Uh, so I, I've made like little lists here and there about like the best fay books you're, you're not reading and stuff like that. So that's been really, really cool. I've gotten, um, you know, shout outs on Instagram from like David Mack um, oh, wow. you know, from Marvel <laughs> and things. 
So it's been really great. I, the response has been awesome. Obviously we all want to be on a bestseller list. You know, you want to see your name on USA Today, New York Times, but then the more you learn about these lists and you realize, well, it's not exactly about sales, kind of who you know. You're just like, look, I just want people, I want to make money obviously off of it, but I've learned that it takes time, a lot of time, which, you know, everybody thinks when you're first getting into this world that you're just going to be that viral sensation. You all want to be that. You know, you really think like, it's just going to take one person. Yeah. And then reality hits you and you go, oh, like all the overnight sensations, you then dig on them and you realize, oh, they've been writing since like, 2004 and they're just yeah. now and yeah. you're like oh okay so it really didn't yeah. happen overnight like that's just what you're told like Hollywood kind of glams it up yeah. so I have to just wait my turn but I'm getting momentum I'm getting steam uh you know I've I've done like <laughs> Barnes and Noble signings which is really cool okay. and when I go to Galaxy Con I have people run up with my book and they're like oh my god you're here and I'm like oh wow I'm here you know I had I was at Galaxy Con I think it was Richmond and I was dressed in cosplay as, as Firestar from Marvel. And I was at the booth doing something. Some girl comes up to me and, and like has my book. And she goes, she's going to be here. And she's <laughs> pointing at it. And I looked at her. I went, yeah. And she goes, I'm going to get her to sign this. And I went, she's me. And then she looked at me and she looked at the book. And she looked back at me. And she went, oh, my God, it's you. And I was like, this is so cool, but so weird. Because yeah. And I was so like grateful for the moment, but I'm like, she read my book. Like there's still that moment of you went out and bought my book and read it. Like, yeah, you still have to go. You spent money on that. Okay, yeah. cool. But yeah. wow. So, you know, like I said, you, you still want to make a million dollars, but then you get a reaction like that and you're like, yeah, it's kind of worth it. Like just yeah. for that moment, you're just like, this is kind of cool. Yeah. So h- how did you get these high profile interviews like the Tamron Hall? H- how did that work out? Uh, it was weird. One of the associate producers just happened to read my book. And then a producer on the show uh, I worked with years ago, the, the associate producer walked in with the book and they were going to do like, I think she does, the, the segment is called Let's Get Lit. And it's like, you know, all the books that they're reading. And she was kind of like nervous to say anything. And then the producer went, I know her. I worked with her years ago. And that's how it just, it just gelled. It was like one of those serendipity moments where you were just like, Oh, and the girl was like, I read this book. It's really good. And mm. then Beth was like, I know Danielle. She's like, I can call her right now if you want. And mm. they were like, well, let's do a pre-interview. Like, she's still got to go through everything. And they pre-interviewed me and came back. And they were like, she's actually kind of cool. And so I had to still go through approvals. And it just happened. It was like a minute segment on um, authors you should know about. And so they did my story. And it was really cool. And, you know, people wrote in and was like, we want to hear more from the nurse. so. You know, I'm hoping they'll have me back and, and do a, a more in-depth interview. But yeah, it was it was really cool. Very cool. What happened to the patient? I'm just curious. That started all of this. <laughs> I'm best friends with him. I talk to him every day. It's okay. been 10 years and we speak every day. And volume two is where he his literary persona is actually the hero of it. Agent Graham is my patient. So the way the whole thing started was he had mentioned that he was recruited by the CIA out of college. So volume two is actually our quote unquote story we joke about where I made it in a Lyme disease clinic about a nurse and the CIA agent, you know, goes undercover to find out if the nurse is a fey human hybrid. That was the original story that we kind of talked about. And I told him, so volume two is urban fantasy and he is agent Graham. So uh, how he was recruited by the CIA, all those little nuggets are in that story. So, yeah, he's now a literary hero, as I call him. You know, that's a secret agent persona. Uh, He can't wait. So when Forgive Us came out, the last short story is Graham, the first time you meet him. So I I sent it to him and he called me right after he read it. And he was like, I love it. He's like, I love Graham. I'm so excited. So he can't wait. And I'm trying I'm still trying to convince him to uh, be on the cover of that, that volume. So he would be Agent Graham because I feel like that's, you know, it's apropos. But we're, we're working on it because he likes being patient. He likes, you know, the uh, anonymity. Okay. But we're working on it. But yeah, I talk to him all the time. How does he feel about your success? He loves, he's probably one of my biggest cheerleaders aside from my husband. 
He's he has all the books. He gives them out for Christmas gifts. Uh, yeah, he loves it, you know, but he doesn't tell anybody he's the patient, which I find funny. Uh, but yeah, he's been really great about it. He read most of them. Uh, he read like in the first draft stages, but you know, volume two, obviously he's okay. more excited about cause it's him. Uh, but you know, he's been, he's been great about it and he's very excited. So it's, it's fun. Has, uh, has he healed or how is his Lyme disease? Going? Uh, it's, it's better, you know, with Lyme. Depends on when you catch it. Okay, is how you you know how you are with it. But he's he's much better. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah, my husband has Lyme, um, but we we caught it pretty early, so he's he's, oh, he's fine now. All right. So I want to talk about marketing. You seem like okay. you know really good at marketing your your books. So if you want to give advice to writers, you can give me also an advice, you know, like I, I always try marketing different uh, ways of doing it. What works best for you? With marketing, I am still, I'm still always experimenting, but I find okay. one, there are enough readers out there for all of us. Authors have gotten very competitive. Teaming up, I, you know, C.R. Rice is uh, an amazing author and her and I have teamed up and people still find that amazing that we've teamed up. They're like, okay. you guys are, and I'm like, we're what? We're, we're allowed as women to okay. lift each other up. So I think that's that's one thing is it's okay to team up with another author. Yeah. No one's going to steal each other's readers. You know, there's more than enough. Know your brand, figure out who you are as a writer and figure out your okay. brand. You can't go out and just be like, I'm an author. I write a book. Cool. That's all I do. Know your brand, know your message okay. and figure out your niche. That's the other thing. And understand okay. that your publisher is probably not going to do it. They're not going to market you. It's it's just, it's not yeah. like days where it used to be where you used to get a big fat like here's your check you know and then you just go write the books we'll handle the rest that's not it uh, you don't have to be an expert on every platform social media pick one know it stick to it you don't have to be on the next big thing like you know everybody's like TikTok's the way to go oh my god I I'm not on TikTok I, I you know it's just like Instagram's what I do that's it I, I okay I. They made me get a Facebook page. I'll be honest. I don't even check it. It's like, yeah, I've got a presence, but Instagram's what I know. Okay. I don't jump to the newest, latest thing. I okay. stick to one thing, unless it's a dinosaur. That's what I do. Uh, so I think it's more of knowing who you are, knowing your brand, knowing your audience, and not being afraid to uh, kind of expand your audience. For a long time, I was told I could not be young adult because I have uh, I challenge religion in the book. So it was like, okay. you not be young adult. And I'm like, but okay. why not? And then I went into a Barnes and Noble recently, probably about six months ago. And they were like, please jump into the young adult category. They said, because we're tired of having moms come in here, throwing us Sarah J Moss and saying, why is my kid reading this? I'm getting in trouble when they're trying to do a book report on it. And uh, he was like, okay. I would love a fay book that okay. has no smut. So like, okay. I would love to put you in that category. So I went back and like really pushed my publisher to say, just try me in young adult and see what happens. And then I started seeing more sales and things like that. So I think you have to be your own advocate at times and do your research. Okay. So that would be another kind of way to go. And you have to try new things. You know, uh, being on the cover was, I had my own version of what was going to happen you know, being a cosplayer, just jumping into that realm and saying, I'm going to take this risk was another thing that I tried and it's paid off. Um, these covers were all limited edition. The deal we made was once the first run was done, that's it. We're going back to typeset. And I have people now like writing the publisher saying, no, 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 put her back on the cover. We don't want the typeset cover. Go back to, you know, go back to the cosplay because a lot of people thought it, it was going to be a failed experiment. So mm. you just have to be willing to try different things and go out there. And when everybody's like, nobody does that. Cause when we did these covers, there were a lot of people who were like an author on the cover and it's not nonfiction. And I was like, Oh, that's right. So this one, is that you? That's me. Oh, wow. Uh, that's yeah. On it's, the cover. it's the blonde hair that kind of threw me. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My dad didn't even recognize me. Yeah. I, I put uh, character okay. on, on the covers. Uh, I'm on all of them except for the novella because that's a dragon. <laughs> but yeah, and they said we'll do one run like that and we'll see. 
And so when they they just changed it back to typeset and there's people writing in going, no, 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 put her back. We want her back on the cover. And a lot of people okay. were like, it's weird because it's it's not a nonfiction, you know, it's a nonfiction, yeah. it's a fiction book, but it should be nonfiction, you know. And now people are like, no, that was really cool. So I think you just yeah. have to be willing to take some chances and realize yeah. at the end of the day, it's your words. It's, you have to commit a hundred percent. So yeah, take the chances. Yeah. Yeah. So you, how do you talk to your audience on Instagram DMs or like, how do you interact with them? What is, yeah, uh, they DM me. I always respond. I also have a football podcast, so I'm, I'm active, you know, we have people like call in with that and sometimes they have book questions. So I've answered okay. those, but, uh, no, I'm very active on Instagram. It's me answering. It's very okay. rarely not me, you know, okay. I can't think of any, I think there's maybe one, one or two times when I was just busy. It wasn't, I wasn't able to get to it, but no, that's me. Uh, I do Instagram lives, things like that. Uh, okay. I know everybody who reaches out, you know, I, I'm pretty active with the readers that are constant. So I okay. know who they are um, okay. and I'll always answer a question. I don't, I okay. don't shy away from controversy either. You know, when things have happened, I've been one to step up and just say, okay, this is what's going on guys. Here we are. This is where we're at, whatever. And I've taken it head on. So I, I love, you know, I love talking to the readers. Mm, how many followers do you have? Uh, about 12,000. Oh, wow. That's... But a lot of them were following me from cosplay. So they were, you know, uh, these were co- people who knew me from cosplay and a lot of them just were jumped in. And that's one thing I could say about the cosplay community is that they're very supportive, very supportive. Mm, so mm. when one of us tries something new, everybody jumps in and is like, all right, cool. You're trying something. Go for it. The pom-poms are out. And, you know, when I've done work, uh, podcasts for like Cosplay Alliance and I've been guests on, they're, they're right there to plug the book. Mm. Because they know, you know, you're making that chance. So the number one sales come from where you think from like media appearances or is it from, it's usually word of mouth. Uh, I don't find book tours do as much as people think, Uh, but you know, it's, um, it will be a podcast that'll usually push it. Uh, I think sometimes it it depends if where, where the media appearance is, that really depends. Uh, if I've done a, a galaxy con, I will okay. see a jump because somebody's walked by the booth. They've taken a card or, you know, they've seen us on a panel Okay, and they've gone from there. And it's, you know, if they didn't buy it at the event, you know, cause I can't sell a Kindle at an event, obviously, yeah. then, you know, they'll go and they'll purchase it because people love their eBooks. I don't, you know, mm, I don't sell those mm. at events. So we yeah. will usually see a jump after a galaxy con event. Oh, interesting. So you, your publishing journey, how did you find your publisher and do, do you have an agent? How, how did that work? Uh, initially for Locked Out of Heaven for the first edition, I had, I, I knew somebody who wanted to rep me and okay. so I let them, I let them rep me and I had an offer from one of the big three for their metaphysical imprint. And I okay. was, they had made the offer and they said, but we just signed, we only signed two to three nonfiction books. Uh, I mean, fiction books a year. Okay. So just closed our third one. They said, so if you come back in January, we'll sign you. We want some changes, but we'll sign you. At that point, it was March. I didn't want to wait a year. So I was like, all right, I'll think about it, whatever. Um, and then a friend of mine who had a nonfiction publishing house said, you know what? We'll take a chance. We'll publish you as our first fiction book. That was okay. a mistake. I said, yes. We released the first edition of Locked Out of Heaven. And I was with them for about a year. And then I just wasn't, it was doing, the book was doing well. There was no problem. But the process of getting the book out, they didn't know how to edit a fiction book. There was editing mistakes, grammatical errors, things like that. It just wasn't the right place. And then I happened to be doing a podcast, uh, Drinking with Authors. Okay. And that's where Four Horsemen met me. And after the interview, she had already heard rumblings of uh, the other publisher. And she's like, are you happy with them? And I'm like, yeah, everything's great. And she's like, yeah, it's not what I heard. And she's like, we do fiction come with us. And so they offered me a contract, I think um, a week later Uh and took me about two or three months of hemming and hawing if I was going to sign. And then I signed with them. Mm, And you still with them. Yeah. I didn't do a lot of querying. I think the only place I queried was uh, a DAW with uh, Penguin. That was the only place that I was like really considering going. 
at one point because, okay. you know, everybody wants to be a penguin. So I had considered that at one point, um, but that was really it. Okay. Okay. So what, what are you working on these days? Uh, right now I have, I just finished, uh, like I said, the novella, which is still in within volume one, same characters. And then I am finishing volume two, working on that. I have three books in that volume. And then I am discussing with two Marvel, I'll call them icons that want to write the forwards for volume two books, uh, for two of them. So I'm talking to them right now to see if, the, um, if their schedules will allow for it. And if it will, that will be amazing. If it won't, say la vie, we'll figure out another time we can work together. So I'm working on that and I'm doing panels for a possible graphic novel to, uh, for an iteration for book one, Locked Out of Heaven, uh, looking at that right now. And then uh, I'm looking, I've done some Oracle cards hmm. for, uh, for that. So I've got a couple things in the hopper and then I'm always, you know, we're always with the pop-up bookshop. We have GalaxyCon Columbus, December 1st through the 3rd in Columbus, Ohio, where we'll be with a bunch of other authors that are great. And uh, we'll see, you know, people there, which are always, you know, we have readers that come from everywhere just to come to the Galaxy Cons and see us. And we do a bunch of panels, cocktails with creatives and, and all these great things. So we'll be at that. And I'm always getting that ready with um, CR Rice. And then CR and I are doing a crossover event between our two worlds, between the realm and the veil. We're doing that. And we're working on that right now as well. Well, wow, you're busy. <laughs> So for I'm trying to stay busy. <laughs> Good for you. So for for anyone who wants to get into that genre to start writing uh you know fantasy novels, fantasy books, what kind of advice would you give them? I think it would be the same for anybody who just wants to start writing in general. Uh the first thing is is to think of not think of fantasy or writing as anything more than interpersonal dynamics. When you write, okay. that's all it really is. Whether you put a pair of horns on them or some scales, <laughs> Okay. It's really all it is. Um, in my books, a lot of the characters are people I know and okay. interactions I've had with them. So whether I throw a tail on them, you know, in the case of Lady Serena, she's inspired by my best friend from high school, Jennifer. So there's a chapter in Locked Out of Heaven called Girl Talk. That's okay. me and Jen sitting on the beach when we thought we knew everything at 16 years old, you know, how we all are. And, you know, it's really deep. That's the same yeah. thing. So I just pulled from real life. I think if you start with that, then you can decide what whatever fantastic world you want to put it in. Okay. If you're going to stick in fantasy, make sure though you have the world building. Think about, you know, the magic system and all that stuff because fantasy readers will pull you apart. You know, they want they still want it to be logical. Okay. It still has to work. You can't just be like, "Oh, the coin flipped and it turned the whole world upside down." Well, why? Like they want to know, "Okay, what's the magic okay. involved?" Uh, you okay. still have to do research. I think there's a misconception that if you write fantasy, there's no research. You still have to have a map. You still have to give them the basic information. Like think of it mm. as if you told somebody, oh, you have to go to the store. Okay. You're going to go down here. You're going to make a left. You're going to do that. Like they still want direction to get there. You can't just okay. be like, oh, it's a world. It, it doesn't work that way. You still have to yeah. world build and kind of go down the street. I did that even with my dragon, I couldn't just have dragons that breathe fire. And everybody was like, well, there they are. They breathe fire. Hmm. I did a lot of research to make sure the dragons were plausible. Like if I was ever on Mythbusters, I don't have to be confirmed, just plausible. Like they just uh, have to exist. And here's, okay. here's why they breathe fire. It can't just be magical. Okay. I hate that. Okay. It's like, why? Give them reasons. Okay. Um, you know, go from there. And how, how how do you do the research? Like Google or do you like go to the library? Like how do you, how, how is I your research? Everywhere. I also okay. watched really bad fantasy movies. Uh, really bad okay. ones. Because okay. Okay. sometimes the really bad ones show you what not to do, but they also have nuggets of like what's good. So I did that. I watched really bad ones. I watched a lot of 80s ones because sometimes those have the best story veins and you can kind of see where the good ideas were. You got to read a lot, obviously. Mm. Uh, for my dragons, I worked with uh, a mechanic, mechanical engineer, a physics professor, and my vet, Gil Stanzione. I sat down. I went in with him one day when my dog had a, um, an appointment, and I literally said, I have an idea for a dragon. And I remember taking his glasses off, and he went, oh, my God, Danielle, what? <laughs> you, you know, he was just like, what now? And I said, I want to build it from the digestive system out. I don't mm. care what they look like yet. I want to start with their stomach. 
And he went, what? Okay. And I remember he opened up. He was like, I'm going to be late at the next appointment and close the door. <laughs> Go back to this idea. And I said, what if I build it from bacteria? And he was like, we're on to something now. And we wound up sitting there talking. And that's how I started. Then I moved on to, I went to um, a professor at Westchester Community College, talked to him about, I want them to fly, but I'm going to base it on the albatross theory of gliding. And then he presented it to his classes, their midterms. Once I found, okay, they can fly, but they can only be as big as a giraffe. Now, now I went to Pandy Van, who's this amazing dragon illustrator. Now I could figure out what do they look like? So I took it in stages and that's how I did the research. And I read a lot of stuff on dragons. I mean, a lot of stuff on dragons. What did you read? To the point where I also bought like the little, I went to Michael's and I bought like all the little figures, the action figures. And I played with them to figure out, like, how do they move? What do they do? But I took probably took way too much time on my dragons, to be honest. But at the end of the day, I was proud of them. And I felt like, okay, if somebody reads this, they're not going to be like, they're dragons. Okay, let me breathe fire, whatever. It was like, oh, I've got dragons that breathe fire, ice, and acid. Cool. I got, like, I got some good dragons that I can now write stories about down the line. And it gave me a good base. Oh, wow. Fascinating. So be, before we conclude, where do people find your books work on your website or on Amazon? What is the best place to get your books? You can get the books on I would say at Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, target.com, bookshop.org, uh, Kobu, Scribed, basically wherever you get your books, you can find them. Uh, they're in stores, they're online. Uh, you know, you can always check birthofthefay.com. And then you can follow me on Instagram at birth of the Fay underscore novel. And that's where all the latest information is. Uh, Locked Out of Heaven is on Audible. It's produced by Skyboat Media. I have two phenomenal narrators. So if you're into your audio books, you can check it out there. Ah, fascinating. Okay, great. I love audiobooks. I listen to audiobooks all the time when I walk my dog and, and you know, doing chores. I love audiobooks. <laughs> it's just such a time saver. Any, any last word before we conclude to anyone who, like an aspiring uh, writer, you know, any... Uh, just write the story that you want to tell. Don't write what you think is the next Game of Thrones, the next Twilight. Just write the yeah. story authentically that you want to tell and the rest will follow. It'll all fall into place. Don't write by committee. Just write whatever you want to write and then let it go. Just put it out there because yeah. you can't edit what's not on paper. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Well, thank you very much. This has been fascinating, especially the research part. Oh my God. This is like really blew my mind. Uh, best thank of you. luck. And thank you very much for joining us today. And for anyone who is listening or watching, thank you for uh, joining us and, uh, you know, for spending an hour with us. And until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Read and Write with Natasha. I'm your host, Natasha Times. If today's episode inspired you in any way, please take the time to review the podcast. Remember to subscribe and share this podcast with fellow book lovers. Until next time, happy reading, happy writing.